Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's webinar from the IIEA, which has as its theme, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And a very special welcome to Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, the Chief Scientist of the World Health Organization. Today's event will last 45 minutes. There will be a presentation of around 20 minutes by our guest speaker, and this will be followed by questions and answers. Please feel free to submit your questions uh, using the question and answer function on Zoom during the presentation, and we will come to the questions after the presentation. Both the presentation and the Q&A are on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. It is a very great pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Sumia Swaminathan and to introduce her formally to you. After a distinguished career in India, where she was a very distinguished pediatrician and researcher in the area of AIDS and the area of uh, tuberculosis, she went on to become Secretary to the Government of India for Health Research and Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research. In 2017, uh, she was appointed to the position of Deputy Director General for Programs at the World Health Organization. And then in 2019, shortly before COVID, she became the chief scientist in charge at the same time of a newly created division on public health. It is a great pleasure for me to hand you the floor. Thank you so much, Mary, and thanks very much to the IIEA for arranging this. Um, what I'd like to do is perhaps uh, share a few thoughts. Of course, there's so much that we can speak about COVID and, and about the vaccines and the rollout and, and many other things, um, the public health measures, the use of diagnostics, the research that's gone behind all of this. Uh, but I, I will touch on a few uh, things which I think are very topical and very important, and then perhaps um, in the Q&A, we could, we could also address other questions that uh, the audience might have. So I will now share my screen and... Um... make the presentation and I hope you can see uh, the screen and that you can hear me well. So just to recap uh, the global situation, because it changes, it's so dynamic. What you see here is a graph with the different colors representing the different WHO regions and the dark black line representing the, um, the daily deaths. And in the last uh, 24 hours or so, of course, this is from yesterday. So uh, it may be a little bit different today. We had almost 400,000 new cases uh, in one day and over 8,000 deaths. And you can see that um, the cases have fluctuated over a period of time and also by region. And on the, on the other side of the slide, you see the countries with the, um, the highest number of cases in the previous 24 hours, uh, Brazil, India. You see a number of countries um, in different regions, actually. You have Colombia, Argentina, um, and then you have Iran. Um, we have Indonesia and India from the Southeast Asia region. Uh, Brazil, of course, is number one. And then also South Africa with the worrying third wave and the Russian Federation. Um, this shows us the uh, cases normalized for populations. So the darker the color, the higher the number of cases that have occurred. This is cumulative from the beginning of the pandemic. And you can see that the Americas, both North and South America and the European region, have really been badly impacted in terms of cases per uh, 100,000 population. And similarly deaths, we see North and South America, the European region, but also South America, um, South Africa, I'm sorry, the Southern African countries also quite badly impacted. Now we had uh, over the last couple of weeks started to see a reduction in the number of cases as well as slowing down in the number of deaths per day, however, when you look at the last seven days, what is very uh, worrying is an increase in cases. So if you look at this uh, column over here, we see that in Africa, cases were up by 18% and deaths by 20% in the last week. 
And you know that we've been saying over the last year that Africa has been relatively less impacted, that we've had fewer cases and deaths, and there's been a lot of discussion on the reasons for that. But this is a very worrying trend, and potentially it's because of the Delta variant that we know is more transmissible than the other variants that we've had so far. And it's very rapidly spreading across the world. We have documented a Delta variant in 95 countries, but it doesn't mean that it's only limited in the 95 countries, because of course, we know that the sequencing uh, speed and, and uh, uh, the uh, amount of sequencing uh, is, is varies from country to country. And many countries in Africa do not have uh, adequate sequencing capacity as of now. We see the Eastern Mediterranean region showing an increase in cases, Europe showing a significant increase in cases and a worrying increase in deaths. Thankfully in the Americas, there's a slight decline or we can say stabilizing with a reduction in the number of deaths. Southeast Asia, again, largely driven by India and Indonesia, the two large countries of that region, um, cases stabilizing, deaths reducing a little bit um, and, and uh, overall a global picture of cases relatively stable, we could say from the previous week and a slight reduction in deaths. But this is, uh, as I said, a dynamic situation and the Delta variant makes things particularly hard to predict. And again, by region, we see the Americas sort of stabilizing, plateauing, Europe starting to show a slight increase, Southeast Asia on its way down, but also Africa showing an increase and Eastern Mediterranean also showing an uptick in cases. Moving on to vaccines, um, or just maybe before we go to vaccines to clarify the issue of the variants that I talked about, which uh, could be accounting for this, uh, this uh, shift in epidemiology. We have four variants of concern, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And then you know that we named them with uh, Greek alphabets because uh, otherwise they have very complicated uh, scientific names or they are being called by the names of the countries from where they originated which sometimes ends up stigmatizing those countries. So this is why we moved to the Greek uh, naming system. And so there are four global variants of concern. And why are they variants of concern? Because they're either more transmissible or they have some properties that make you more sick uh, with more severe illness, or they have some properties, uh, some mutations that enable them to avoid some of the antibodies uh, that are generated by vaccination. And so they need higher levels of antibodies. So, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta all have uh, some properties, but the delta by far till date is the most highly transmissible. Uh, it's 50% more transmissible than the alpha variant, which was the one that became dominant across the world in 2020, and delta is on its way now to becoming the dominant strain. Luckily, the vaccines still work. Now, we've crossed 3 billion doses of uh, vaccines administered across the world, over 215 countries uh, or uh, territories. Uh, the COVAX facility has shipped about 90 million doses to 133 participants. There are only five countries that have not started vaccinating yet. But if you look at the color uh, in this graph, you can see that all of Africa is very light green and a large proportion of here, Eastern Europe, Eastern Mediterranean region and large parts of Southeast Asia also light green. COVAX was set up last year in order to uh, both accelerate the development of new vaccines and the equitable access. Now, the, 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 we, should, we, aim, we aim to distribute at least 2 billion doses of vaccines by the end of 2021. This graph actually shows the um, participants in dark blue that have received doses from COVAX, as I mentioned, 133, um, and there are others in light blue that are vaccinating either through their own vaccines or with bilateral arrangements or donations. What the, the issue has been really with supply into COVAX because by now we should have shipped 400 million doses. We're still at 90 million. And this is because uh, we, we just don't get the supplies from the manufacturers, uh, including those that have signed contracts and that had agreed uh, to supplying COVAX. And we can discuss more, you know, the, de the details about that. Here are the top 10 countries in terms of uh, uh, administered doses, clearly China on top uh, with over a billion uh, vaccines administered and 77% uh, of doses have been, have been administered by these 10 countries. So this is where the inequity uh, starts becoming obvious when you look at the WHO member states with a coverage of over 20% 
you can see that in the Afro region, uh, only two um, out of the 47 countries have uh, achieved anything close to 20%. And if you remember 20% was a target that we set, which would help, which would have covered uh, the high risk groups. That's the frontline workers, the health workers and social workers, those in vulnerable positions, as well as the elderly and those with underlying um, illnesses and comorbidities. These are the people who are at highest risk of getting infection, highest risk of dying. And so if we had by now, uh, and with the 3 billion doses, by the way, we could have covered 20% of every country and we could have protected these people instead of continuing to see the deaths that we're seeing today. But, but you can see that there's a difference between regions. This uh, shows that the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines are the two most widely used, but there are, you can see a number of vaccines out there and, uh, and this is a success of the, the um, scientific uh, work and the R&D collaborations that have happened that have enabled the vaccines to be delivered, but not enabled an equitable access. And so this is another way of looking at it. If you look at doses um, per 100 population, high income countries, 74 doses for every 100 people, the very lowest income countries, only one dose per 100 uh, people. And, and so there's a huge and widening inequity here. Many countries we know are moving very quickly to covering 60 to 70 percent of their adult populations, whereas here, not even the elderly, not even the healthcare workers have been vaccinated. Now, what about other things, uh, essential health services? So WHO has uh, done a couple of rounds of uh, two rounds actually of the pulse surveys where we looked at um, how has a pandemic impacted other services, and we see that while things have improved a little bit, you know the a drop in disrupted services from 54% in mid-2020 to 37% in early 21. It's still a large number of essential services, particularly again in the high-income countries that, uh, in the low-income countries, I'm sorry, that are impacted. And um, you can see across all the major health areas, so maternal and child services, immunization, uh, and non-communicable diseases, mental, neurological, and substance use disorders, communicable diseases like TB and malaria, neglected tropical diseases. So the impact of the pandemic is on, on people and on their health is not just directly people getting ill or dying of COVID, but getting ill and not able to get access to services. If you develop TB, for example, there were lockdowns in many countries, there were patients unable to access health services. There were uh, supply chain disruptions. There were, there were stockouts in drugs and diagnostics all of this, and of course the health workforce, doctors and nurses and other health workers were all mobilized to deal with COVID. And therefore all of these other things um, have led, uh, so that's what when we talk about excess mortality uh, due to the pandemic, it's, it's partly due to COVID itself directly causing deaths, but a lot of deaths which would otherwise uh, have not occurred uh, if health services had been functioning. What about access to, to vaccines in general? As I mentioned, routine immunization was disrupted in 2020. This continues in many countries, while many countries are really trying to get their systems uh, back up. We saw in May 2020, 67% of countries reported some degree of disruption to immunization. A year later, 37% continue to report uh, disruptions. Mass campaigns were disrupted, particularly things like measles, yellow fever, polio. This is putting uh, a lot of uh, millions of uh, people, especially children, at risk and, pool and measles is something we're really worried about um, because measles outbreaks we know can, can really um, uh, be devastating. A word about vaccine hesitancy because I think um, this is really, really important as we're trying to ramp up vaccination coverage, not just for COVID, but for other vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, and if you want to achieve you know, what's called herd immunity or population immunity, you need to get to that 70-80%. What we need to understand is that attitudes are dynamic and evolving, and there's substantial variation across demographics and uh, at a subnational level. These are quite context specific, so what applies in Ireland may not specifically apply in Nigeria or in India. Ethnicity, geography, education, socioeconomic status, employment, all of these matter. Um, hesitancy 
is a hurdle that information alone does not address. But it does, there are ways of decreasing hesitancy. An important factor is trust in government, which translates into trust in vaccines and a lack of transparency feeds mistrust. But even uh, when we are transparent, there are still a lot of conspiracy theories out there which impact uh, people's beliefs. And we, what we need are targeted interventions that are based on local data, local understanding of what people really believe, what their concerns are. And we need to uh, focus on these specific groups where there is a higher level of uh, hesitancy. So this again, a global map to show the vaccine programs that have been disrupted and it, it shows you actually by antigen or by the type of vaccine. So we, we did um, uh, show you, uh, I showed you data on, on vaccine distribution, but the same applies to ther therapeutics and diagnostics as well. And you can see that uh, high income countries do uh, this typo here, this should be high income countries do 125 times more tests per day than low income countries. And we've also all seen what shortages of oxygen look like across the world in India and in Brazil and Nepal and now in Africa, Tanzania, for example, um, Uganda, really uh, struggling with shortages of oxygen. And, um, and therefore there is a need to improve the manufacturing capacity in countries around the world so that there is no you know, reliance on a particular country or countries to supply these products. And we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, a similar uh, disruption in supply chains of, of, of uh, uh, personal protective equipment like masks and gloves and PPE suits. And we see that happen time and again. So WHO obviously has been working you know, across um, all of these uh, areas, monitoring the pandemic, you know, so making sure that we, we have the latest in the epidemiology, strengthening local regulatory capacities and ethical guidance. This is something the WHO has done for a long time, working with national regulatory agencies, with ethics committees, um, enhancing clinical research, development and trials. I'll say a little bit more about that. The ACT Accelerator was created to mobilize resources for diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, and also to support health systems. And then ensuring now the latest are efforts on developing uh, capacity for, for production of uh, particularly vaccines, but also other health products. On the ethics side, we've done a fair amount of work, I think over the last year or so with our bioethics working group, uh, ex excellent external experts, international experts that have come out. This is just a, an example of some of the products on mandatory vaccination on on how to do placebo controlled trials, um, on, on human challenge studies for COVID, on um, digital tracking technologies and the ethical considerations around them. And these are useful um, for people, not just for research, but also just to think about the issues. We've also got ethics guidance on what do you do when you have limited vaccine supplies? How do you prioritize groups? The R&D blueprint has been very active. This was set up in 2015 after the Ebola outbreak. Essentially, what it does is it, it, it prioritizes pathogens that can cause epidemics and pandemics. It, um, uh, it develops a research roadmap uh, with target product profiles, with regulatory standards, with trial designs, and innovative analytical frameworks. And there was always a pathogen X in the, in the R&D blueprint, which of course turned out to be the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So very quickly, the uh, expert groups mobilized and, and started looking at animal models, at assays. You know, there's a need for standardizing assays when you're talking about doing studies in different countries. We developed core protocols for clinical trials, target product profiles, which really helped vaccine developers, for example, to have the benchmarks against which their product would be tested and also prioritizing which drugs should move ahead. And then looking beyond um, the emergency use listing and, and studies which need to be done post licensure. The Solidarity Therapeutics Trial is an example of multi-country collaboration on research, over 500 hospitals in over 30 countries coming together to test uh, drugs. Uh, we started with repurposed drugs last year and are now moving on to looking at uh, drugs that modulate the immune system and can help to reduce mortality. I mentioned the ACT um, 
accelerator uh, that was created with three uh, streams of work on vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments, but also a cross-cutting uh, connector on health systems support and a global access and allocation framework that was developed by WHO to ensure that once you have the products, you need to ensure equitable access. I mentioned variants and the problems that uh, uh, we can foresee because of that and, the, and how the variants might impact not just the efficacy of vaccines, but also public health measures that, are, that could be needed, uh, may, that you may need to be modified to deal with different vaccines and uh, different variants. And so we have a, a coordination mechanism, a risk assessment and monitoring framework now that works with partners, with researchers, with member states, does the risk, risk assessments, defines the research agenda, makes recommendations, which can then be used by member states to either modify public health measures or change uh, the use of uh, drugs, vaccines, et cetera, if needed. The most recent uh, work stream um, in COVAX has been the manufacturing task force, which is uh, where, under which there are four work streams. WHO's leading work stream three, which is on expanding sustainable manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries. And, and there are a number of partners that have come together, uh, including private sector, civil society. The idea really is to both unblock immediate supply chain issues, looking at you know, things like export permits and so on, uh, creating a, an input supply visibility partnership where uh, companies can come together and share uh, their uh, needs you know, on, on what uh, may be holding up vaccine production and looking at expanding film finish capacity, also landscaping the uh, global manufacturing capacities. For example, we know that Africa as a continent has very little manufacturing capacity and is dependent on imports for most of their health products. So that really needs to change. And that's why we're starting with this concept of a technology transfer hub where a global network of such hubs would, would of course in the longer term um, improve the capacity of LMICs. But the first thing we're doing is to start with an mRNA tech transfer hub. And the first hub has been announced in South Africa. It will bring together the government along with researchers, with developers, with the holders of intellectual property. This hub will, will uh, so if you look at this journey to establish this kind of a hub, we put out an expression of call for expressions of interest. We define the criteria. We've announced the first hub. We are now in the design phase. We need to develop a business plan, secure funding. We, we don't need to build any buildings because South Africa already has existing companies that will take this on. But then this hub becomes the site for training. And then other countries send teams to come and learn uh, the technology and then take it back to their countries and set up production sites, starting with mRNA, but then hopefully going on to other technologies. And all of this will lead to better and new vaccines, affordable, uh, as well as contribute towards regional health security. So that's again, just to say that we had a very good response to this. We uh, have done the due diligence. We had over 50 responses, both from uh, potential tech donors and the sites for hubs, but also from countries and manufacturers that would like to be recipients. So you can see that across Latin America, Asia, and uh, Africa, there's, there's a lot of interest really in receiving the technology. And I think um, I will stop just by saying that um, we, um, there's constantly new challenges, more work uh, to be done. Uh, uh, obviously we're not at the end of this, uh, pandemic uh, at all. And um, in fact, Dr. Tedros has said many times um, that this year, 2021, actually may turn out to be worse than 2020 because we had uh, many countries taking very strict action in 2020 to limit the impact of the pandemic. But now with pandemic fatigue, with the feeling that, uh, that we are over the worst, and also because of economic compulsions, people have to go back to work to earn their living. You know, schools, the impact on children has been immense. Um, hundreds of millions of children have been out of school now for more than a year, missing out not only on education, but very often on their midday meals, their, uh, their uh, nutritional needs, as well as their psychological and social needs. And so we haven't talked about all of the other impacts that this pandemic has had, but clearly 
uh, we need to think about those as, as we rebuild and also ensure that there's, uh, that the world is moving ahead together, that we don't, uh, we're not in a situation where there are now two diverging worlds, one that's getting back to normal life as we knew it before the pandemic because of the availability of vaccines and the other world, which is still struggling with increasing cases and health system uh, overburdening uh, as well as deaths. So I will, I will stop there and, and turn it back to Mary to uh, facilitate the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that uh, very detailed and very, very interesting presentation. Um, can I just ask a question uh, myself initially? Uh, you pointed to uh, work at, at really at, at great um, uh, speed to address deficiencies that were there for a long time, building capacity, manufacturing capacity, uh, building manufacturing um, uh, hubs, uh, transfer of technology. But all of these, even with the sense of urgency you have conveyed, will take time. Is there anything that can be done at the COVAX end to speed up delivery of vaccines in the next few weeks and months? Yes, that's a very good point. Thank you for that question. Um, absolutely. So we are taking a, a longer term approach, but in the short term, what is it that we can do? I think the first thing is the sharing of uh, vaccines. Many countries now have um, adequate vaccines. They have already covered you know, 30, 40, 50% of their uh, populations. And this is the time to start really sharing those uh, doses with countries, which as I showed, haven't even gone beyond 1%. So I think that can make a huge difference. It started happening. Several countries have already started sharing what they have and co through COVAX so that it goes equitably to countries which really need it. Uh, so in the immediate, we are asking that we receive at least 250 million uh, doses. Uh, in fact, we're already through June. We were asking for it in June and July, um, but very much in the short term, because our goal is let's get to at least 10% coverage of every country by September and 40% of population of every country by the end of the year. That's the goal. And it can be done, as I showed, if the 3 billion doses had been equitably distributed, we would have gotten to 20% everywhere by now. So that's the most urgent is the sharing of doses from countries that have it uh, or excess supplies many countries have before they start vaccinating you know, the children, before they start giving second doses as boosters to the adults, please share with COVAX so the vulnerable can be protected. The second is for manufacturers to prioritize COVAX. Many manufacturers are prioritizing countries which are paying them maybe higher prices. Uh, so it's not very transparent how the deals are being done. And even though COVAX has deals with com companies, we find that we often are at the end of the priority list and not at the, at the top. So that's the request for manufacturers. And thirdly, we request all countries to facilitate exports and imports of substances, raw materials, ingredients, because you know vaccine manufacturing is complex. No one country has everything needed for a vaccine. So there are you know, hundreds of ingredients that go into vaccines. These need to move across borders. And we've seen that many countries have imposed restrictions, which make it very difficult. So I think these three actions will facilitate in the short term, the increase of the supplies into COVAX and then out into countries very rapidly. That happens very rapidly. It happens in a matter of days. Um, and then the more longer term uh, sustainable supply will come later. Thank you. I have a question here from Claude Quain, one of our researchers at the Institute, and she asks, how can states design longer term strategies beyond current measures to help societies live with COVID-19? Um, how has your timeline for the pandemic changed since the emergence of the new strains? Yes. So, um, this is a very good question and uh, situation is dynamic. I think uh, there are still a lot of things we don't know about this virus. On the immune system, I think there's good news. It looks like we do mount a good immune response, uh, both to natural infection and to the vaccine. And we believe that this immune response will be longer lived. So hopefully we're not going to need boosters every year and so on. But again, we're not sure till we do the follow-up and the studies. Um, can we eradicate this virus at this point? I don't think so. It's, uh, it's going to be difficult because it's everywhere. And it's also shown that it can go between animals and humans. You know, it's uh, a number of animal species that uh, have shown that they can be infected. 
But so what we need to do is get it to a point where it becomes a manageable respiratory infection, perhaps something like influenza uh, or other respiratory viruses, which, which for the majority are mild infections that most people recover from. A few people could get sick, but those are the people who need to be protected through vaccines. And I think the big difference here is we have safe and effective vaccines, much, much better than the vaccines we have for influenza. We have diagnostics. We also know how to treat sick people now. Uh, corticosteroids work. We still don't have good antivirals, but that's again under development. Maybe we will have uh, an oral uh, antiviral drug that can stop if taken early. So there needs to be continued research and development investment in that. There needs to be more clinical trials, but we need to make sure that in the short term, I'm talking about the next six months as vaccine coverage expands across the world, the public health measures, the wearing of masks, you know, the maintaining the distance, not gathering in huge groups and uh, mass gatherings, avoiding all of that, because we've seen how the variants can take off. You know, you, you need one infected person in a crowd uh, of people uh, to, to infect a lot of other people. And, and then of course it spreads so quickly across boundaries and, and national borders. You cannot keep these viruses away from uh, borders. So this is why all countries need to still show that this people need to show that discipline for some more time to come while we make sure that uh, once every every country is up to say let's say 40 percent or 50 percent of vaccine coverage things definitely should start to improve so that should be our focus in the next six months um thank you for that um there's a question here from alex conway from the iiea and he asks if um from your, your slides, he noted that there seem to be very few EU countries in either the tech donor or tech hub list uh, in your presentation. Um, could the EU be doing more in this area? So the, we're actually working very closely with the EU and they're a, a very strong partner uh, with us, the uh, European Commission and the um, um, both DG Sante and the INTPA. Uh, are committed to working with us to funding. We are also talking with some of the companies that reside in the European Union on technology transfer. These take time and you know they, these are complex uh, discussions, but certainly the EU has a very uh, important role to play here because they, they have the capacity both for research and development and, and the clinical trials, as well as the medicines agency, the European medicines agency which you know, Africa is now trying to replicate as an African med medicines agency. So there's a lot of capacity building and training that can be done, as well as, of course, uh, on the technology transfer and, and, and the experience with manufacturing that Europe has uh, can now be taken to Africa and, and then to other regions as well. So uh, we have very good partnership, uh, both with member states, as well as with the European um, Commission itself. Um. Uh, another question here uh, from um, Oxfam Ireland, Michael McCarthy Flynn, and he references the fact that the WHO uh, Director General has supported the TRIPS waiver um, and praised the commitment by the United States in support of the temporary waiver of intellectual property. Um, how do you see this issue developing? Um, what sort of is this something that is a long term um, issue as distinct from getting? Uh, the vaccines in the arms of those who need them as quickly as possible. Yeah, and, um, you know, the TRIPS waiver obviously is something under discussion at the World Trade Organization. That's where the negotiations, uh, you know, are taking place. But I think the reason that uh, DG Tedros and the WHO supported it is that in a pandemic, we have to have different modes of operation. We cannot go by the rules that that may have been agreed to in, in a normal uh, time. So we need the TRIPS waivers and flexibilities to be operational because you don't want a country by country uh, approach to dealing with the TRIPS uh, flexibilities, which of course every country can now, I think under the rules. But if you had a, a, a waiver, then it would uh, not need that intensive work that would need to be done by each country and all the legal issues. So that's one. But having said that, I think um, the TRIPS waiver alone is not going to result miraculously in uh, suddenly scaling up vaccine manufacturing in countries, because it's not just a question of the patents or the IP, it's really the know-how. 
and uh, it is uh, years of R and D and uh, the know-how that's been developed and has been shown to work. If the owners of that know-how were willing to share that and train others, then this could happen very quickly. It might still happen without that. So you could have a group in a country X that decides that they want to create the same vaccine that Moderna created or BioNTech created, but it could take them years to do that. You know, so, so patents could be a barrier. They're not necessarily a barrier in, in every country because in many low income countries, you find that the patents are not the barrier, but it's the know-how. And in a pandemic, you cannot waste years of, uh, of time trying to develop something when somebody knows how to do it. So this is why we're saying the tech transfer uh, needs to happen. And uh, we need many more manufacturing sites across the world producing vaccines now. And of course, for the future, uh, once you learn the technology, then you can use it, uh, hopefully to make other vaccines as well. So that's, uh, it's a two pronged uh, approach. The TRIPS waiver addresses some of the issues. It is also a very good signal, I think, to say that in a pandemic, we should not bring any obstructions. But then beyond that, we, we do need this kind of uh, collaboration to actually make it happen. That leads me into, into um, the next question. And that is, has this pandemic better informed our understanding of public health from a World Health Organization perspective? And I ask you this as the head of the division dealing with public health. health and how can we ensure the lessons are not forgotten as has happened with previous epidemics or pandemics? Yes. <laughs> and I it's don't, a big question. It's a big question and maybe you have uh, some thoughts on, on how do we make sure that we don't go back into these cycles of panic and neglect that we've seen in the past. That's exactly our concern. And that is why we want uh, countries to come together and discuss a pandemic treaty so that we put in place some binding rules and regulations. But what the pandemic has done has exposed, I think, the inadequacies of investment in public health. And I'm saying this for all countries, high income uh, to low income. We've seen how uh, systems got overwhelmed, not necessarily, I mean, the tertiary hospital systems got overwhelmed, but what we saw was the public health systems did not were not strong enough to do the contact tracing and the, the tracking of people and the quarantining on the, and the scaling up of uh, those uh, essential services that were needed. There wasn't the resilience or the capacity in most health systems. So this is why it needs investment. And again, WHO and Dr. Tedros in particular has been talking about uh, investment in universal health coverage as the primary thing that every country needs to do because universal health coverage basically covers all of these things that we're talking about from surveillance to the health workforce to having the medical products to having the data systems and to be able to have a good governance that responds and is able to quickly pivot to whatever the urgent needs may be. And, and also we, of course, uh, with universal health coverage, we also that includes investments in upstream determinants of health, like, uh, like addressing air pollution, like making sure there's clean water and sanitation, like making sure that, this, um, that nutrition needs are addressed, that mental health needs are addressed. So we often think about the health system only as a healthcare delivery. And we forget that many of these upstream factors, the risk factors, the determinants are actually what keep us healthy and well. Uh, and we need to prevent ourselves from getting ill. So I think it's all interconnected and it deals with prioritizing health. And I hope that all countries have seen today that if you do not prioritize health, that everything else can collapse and the economy will be in shambles. And uh, it's not just a pandemic that can do that, right? We have so many existing issues that we're not dealing with that are impacting health. So uh, yes, I think the question is a very good question. How do we keep that? Uh, that focus, I think there are suggestions now from many bodies, from the G7, the G20, and, and all of these, big, the IPPR that was set up by WHO, the Independent Pandemic Preparedness Risk Review, have all, uh, I think, more or less recommended that there should be a kind of a global health council or a board, um, or a global health security council that will uh, perhaps be the G20 represented at the highest level which would constantly uh, be alive to these issues and be able to address and also to hold each other accountable. I think it's important that there should be accountability as well, that we should not be pointing fingers at each other, 
but really trying to address the fundamental issues. I'm coming to the, the end of the time and, and we are very, very appreciative of, of, of your um, participation. Can I ask you one final question? Because I've been reading what you had to say about the need for better data collection and you had some extremely interesting things to say in that area. And it ties in with what you said in your presentation about countering vaccine hesitancy. Mm. Just maybe finish with a few comments on how you see the issue of, of better the data collection going forward as a means of combating these health um, uh, threats? Yes, I think data is critical because without data, you're completely flying blind. And in fact, you know, when we say that Africa has very few cases and deaths, a lot of it is the lack of data. Uh, and surveys that have been done actually have shown that there have been many more cases than have been reported. And this is true for many countries, because I mentioned about the lack of diagnostics. There's data on deaths, uh, what we call the civil registration system, which in many high income countries is, a, is a taken for granted, you know, every birth and death is registered and accounted for. But in many countries, even that basic system is not available. So you don't know how many people die every year, you don't know what they're dying of. And so you don't know what your disease burden is. So starting with very fundamental vital registration systems, but then moving on to these uh, integrated uh, um, health data information systems, which are linked. Again, we see silos within health systems. Uh, we see a program for TB data and a program for malaria and nothing talks to each other. So this is why we have prioritized data and digital health as areas of focus over the next several years. And um, there's a science division. There's also the data and a delivery division that looks at how to strengthen health systems. And within science, we have digital health, where we now have a global strategy, which lays out a roadmap for the next 10 years. And uh, we'll be working closely with countries to build those capacities. But um, without, uh, and, and you know, we see the, the de deficiencies because countries report their health data to us. And very often we have data which is not even disaggregated by sex or age. That's the very basic, what you would expect. And so if you don't know, uh, you know, how many men, how many women, which age group your, your particular disease is impacting, it's very hard to do anything about it and to have policies that will have an impact. So it's, uh, again, I think the pandemic brought out the weaknesses in the systems we have. And uh, so as we think about these investments in health, I think data and health information systems are going to be uh, very critical. And, and just to end perhaps with the hesitancy again, you need social science and behavioral science here as well, because public health uh, needs that connection with public uh, and, and uh, with understanding and with the attitudes and uh, views and practices, and that's contextual. So every country needs to be able to invest in, um, when we talk about research, it's not only biomedical research, but it's also social sciences research and, and the, interdisciplinary research, uh, which will ultimately lead to better uh, program implementation. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the breadth of your knowledge. And above all, thank you for the work you're doing on behalf of all of us in the World Health Organization. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.